Yeah, it's called Conversations with Jeff, not Screaming Matches. Yeah, yeah I, 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 you and I do not agree on Calvinism. But look how nice we are to each other. I think it's going to really shock a lot of people, thrill a lot of people. A lot of people are going to have to do some soul searching. It's like, you know what? What are you doing? You're spending all your time trying to destroy another Christian because you don't understand what's going on Mm -hmm. when you should be out there winning people for Jesus. Right. Thank you for the job you're doing. Thanks for being willing to address these kind of issues. They're vital to the church. I feel sorry for what's coming your way, but God bless you, man. It's it's a good, healthy conversation, and, and let's keep growing together in the Lord. People won't change unless they hear the truth, though, and so we need to know the truth, uh, speak the truth, and then the last one I would say is that we need to stay in the truth, uh, no matter what the consequences are. Okay, everybody, welcome to today's episode of Conversations with Jeff. Uh, as, you, as you've been uh, following along, you know, we, we've been putting out a new show, uh, you know, almost every day, uh, you know, for the, like the last several weeks, especially with the, the shutdown. So it's been a lot of fun, a lot of different people, a lot of different conversations, a lot of different topics. Uh, before we get started, just wanted to uh, remind everybody as well, um, I have uh, recently co-founded the uh, an organization called the American Conservative Movement, which is all geared around, uh, you know, pushing conservative values and discussion constitutionally constitutional rights and liberties and that sort of thing. If you're at all interested in that at all, you can go to AmericanConservativeMovement.com. Fill out your information. You can leave your email. Uh, there's, we've already had thousands of people sign up uh, wanting more information on that. So check that out, AmericanConservativeMovement.com. We have a, an upcoming online conference called Saving America Conference on May 9th. We had our first one this last weekend. We're going to be doing it again. It's, it's a lot of fun, a lot of information, a lot of great speakers. So uh, definitely check that out. Uh, well, I'm really excited about today. Uh, we've, we've got uh, Aaron Wren joining us for this episode of Conversations with Jeff. And, you know, and, you know, and one of the things that I like to do to kind of kick things off is uh, every time I have somebody new on, I give them kind of a chance to share their background, you know, their testimony, maybe be how they became a Christian, that sort of thing, just so people can kind of get to know you uh, as we head into this conversation. Sure. Well, thanks for having me on, Jeff. Again, I um, I guess a short story on me. I grew up in rural southern Indiana. Anna, uh, about four miles outside of a town of 29 people. Uh, my parents were divorced when I was five, so I was like the child, first generation child of uh, no fault divorce, uh, and uh, was raised uh, in a church. Both my uh, sides of my family had been Catholic, uh, but my mother ended up getting involved in the Catholic charismatic renewal movement in the 70s, and we ended up moving essentially out to the country as a little bit part of that kind of back to the land movement. Uh, and I was raised in a rural uh, Assemblies of God, so sort of Pentecostal uh, church. Went off to college at Indiana University and really, really didn't go to church or, quite frankly, live for God as an adult. Um, I would always say I believed in God, uh, but uh, certainly my life was 100% the opposite right, of God. After graduation, I uh, moved to Chicago, had a career in IT consulting, uh, for a very long time, so I still do a lot of tech work today. Okay. And, uh, you know, I got married and things were going great. And then I, uh, a couple things happened. One, I started writing a blog about cities called The Urbanophile, The Lover of Cities. Um, as someone who came from a small town, moved to Chicago, it was really a transformational experience for me. And that really uh, kind of got me very interested in writing about cities. And it became super popular. So I decided to, to leave my, uh, my job at this uh, you know, IT consulting company and try to professionalize that. And right about that time as well, and probably linked, to, to be quite honest, um, ended up getting divorced. And so my divorce was really, I mean, I would say the catalyst for my really becoming a, a Christian for real, if you would say that. Uh, so, uh, you, you know, it was, it was a tough time. It's like a lot of people, I wish I had, I had some great story. It's kind of prosaic, you know, you, you run into problems in, in life and it sends you, you running to God. And, and that's a great thing, I think, for a lot of people. Uh, but I ended up moving to New York City and uh, was a senior fellow with the Men Institute, uh, which is a, a think tank there, uh, generally seen as a conservative think tank, uh, working on urban policy, uh, which I loved. Ended up getting remarried 
uh, and uh, have a son. And then we actually just moved back to Indianapolis. Uh, to be, we're, we're both from Indiana, close to the family um, in, uh, you know, in December. So it turned out to be great. I must say the the uh, the time to get out of New York was was just about right, I must say, in light of what's going going on with the virus. So. Uh, yeah, so that's that's a little bit about me, and uh, you know some of that story is related to the work I do with my Christian men's newsletter, which we we may talk about in a bit here. Yeah, definitely, and you know, it, 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 one of the things that you know was interesting to me too was was like you know your involvement in dealing with a, a lot of like I think like deciphering a lot of the urban uh, development and things that are kind of going on within that. Now, how do you feel like all of this stuff with coronavirus is going to be affecting all of that? long term because i feel like obviously right now everything's on lockdown everything's crazy but coming out of it i feel like is what everybody's really concerned about like for the next 18 months two years kind of a thing well one thing i've seen is especially during the last 25 years the reactions to crises have often proven to be the exact opposite of what you might have thought so the paradigmatic example is after 9 11. you thought after 9 11 there would have been a big exodus out of New York. Uh, businesses would say, look, the terrorism risk is going to be too high of being in New York. We need to be in, you know, Charlotte or someplace like that, where it's going to be much lower profile. There were a lot of back office finance jobs that ended up moving to Charlotte and places like that. But the truth is the next decade after 9-11 was better than the decade before 9-11. Right. And so um, a lot of people might have said, um, so, so, you know, what ended up happening, I think, out of, out of 9-11 is sort of the existing power factions who were able to uh, successfully take advantage of the cri cri crisis to pursue their agenda are the uh, Let's see, we're, we're kind of losing you here. Let's see. I think we lost him. Let's see if we can't get him back really quick. Two seconds while we try to reconnect really quick. Hello. Hey there. We lost you. But... We'll get cut off. I hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> no, it's all um, good. Yeah. <laughs> that's a little challenging these days. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, you probably got to um, where, where did we lose you? Where did I lose you there? Uh, we we're kind of talking about like the the powers that be that are kind of take, taking advantage yeah. of like a crisis and that sort of thing. Yeah. So I think in nine eleven, what you basically saw was that was the neocons, and so with the neocon ascendancy um, and 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 kind of the the you know Iraq War, the Afghan War, you know the Patriot Act, things that frankly were all had been on their agenda for quite a while, they were able to successfully push. And so when we look at this, I think the obvious thing you'd say is, well, people are going to get out of New York City. And maybe in the short term, that's going to be the case. In the long term, will that happen? That's a really good question. I don't know. Um, but I do think it, all the people out there, everybody's pushing their, their agenda that they already had. You don't see anybody pushing a new agenda right now. And so it's essentially the, the same old players trying to take advantage of the crisis in order to do do what they want. And so I think who's able to get the upper hand probably determine a lot of what happens. Again, another example, the financial crash. You might have thought the financial crash would mean we're going to rein in the bank, but that didn't happen. Yeah. Right? The banks got too big to fail, bailouts, et cetera. So yeah. a lot of times the result is exactly the opposite of what we might have predicted. Right. You know, and I feel like, you know, dealing with uh, with this whole crisis that we got going on right now with like coronavirus and all of that, I mean, we're seeing, you know, that, you know, those that were, you know, big government, uh, you know, kind of, you know, politicians and things like that. They're really making the push, obviously, on big government solutions. We're doing shutdowns. We're doing uh, bailouts. We're doing all this kind of stuff. And then you're seeing, you know, the people that are the more true conservatives and things like that. Then they're coming out and they're like, no, we want to go back to work, kind of like screw all of the all of right. the you know big government kind of stuff. And I feel like at a certain point, we're getting more and more polarized, but then at a certain point, it's this fight over the soul of our country to a certain degree too, which I think is fascinating. Yeah, I mean, and it, it really is. I mean, it, it, things have become so polarized and the polarization is not new. Um, you know, this has been building for a while, but it's getting more and more and more to the point that there's really nothing that happens now that people don't stake out stake out their their positions on 
Um, it's unfortunate, but it's also the reality that we live in. There's kind of a prisoner dilemma aspect of this. We might all be better off if we didn't have it, but if I give up, if I give up my partisanship and you don't, you'll steamroll me. So it's sort of like we, we both end up in the defect quadrant, and uh, it's not good. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, now, we'll just we'll just see what happens. Yeah. Now, now, I mean, do, you, do, you, been, do you but do you feel like there's going to be an end to the, the polarization to a certain degree and to the extreme that I feel like it's gotten lately, or do you feel like it's just going to keep going indefinitely? What I think we see is that both political parties are seeing their traditional coalitions fracture, and there's something of a real realignment taking place. Clearly, with Trump, um, it took place first in the Republican Party. Um, there was just, um, you know, J.D. Vance who wrote the book Hillbilly Elegy. He was just out with an article today, essentially slamming the Republican donor class and, you know, neoliberalism, trade and globalization and all of that. So you've got guys like him and others. My former colleague, Warren Cass, is arguing over, you know, that we, he wrote a book called The Once and Future Worker. Work, that we need to have more worker-centric conservatism. You know, First Things Magazine and some of them have been doing things, the Claremont Institute. So there's different groups that are staking out different positions with that kind of go away from kind of the Reagan era uh, um, traditions of, of kind of modern conservatism. You can think of AEI, for example, uh, you know, Enterprise Institute. They're pretty staying the Reaganism, of course, but a lot of other people are, are um, uh, going uh, changing, right? So we sort of... Republican coalition uh, cracking up a little bit. Trump is both a, a uh, you know, a manifestation of that, but also has ca- kind of caused it. A lot of the people who people who fell into the never Trump camp have now left the Republican Party, gone to the Democratic Party. You know, George Will, for example, Ma- Max Boot. Uh, so it's causing a realignment. On, I think on the Democrat side, it's less advanced because, um, uh, you know, who knows? But we, we've seen definitely this kind of like socialist, young socialist insurgency, the DSA. It's kind of fashionable to be a socialist today. If you're, if you're a young person on the left, there's a lot of unhappiness. Now, they've they just, again, kind of – they just uh, you know stole it from Bernie again, I think, basically by coordinatedly getting everybody but Joe Biden to drop out, with the exception of Elizabeth Warren, who was the other kind of like – who took votes away from Bernie but didn't take them away from Biden – so their establishment is still holding on um, right now, but I think in the future there's going to be quite a different alignment there as well. So I think we're going to see some new, new alignments. It may not be that the party, the, there will still be a Republican Party and a Democratic Party, but they may have different voters and different ideas, just as they've changed ideas many times throughout history. I mean, even within my lifetime, you know, people think of evangelicals as being a solidly Republican voting bloc, but don't forget that um, Jimmy Carter was the first evangelical president. And in 1980, a plurality of evangelicals still identified as Democrats. So they did not become predominantly predominantly Republican until well into the Reagan administration. And so that was one of the alignments that occurred. There were probably many others. Um, Obviously, demographic change uh, in terms of, you know, the baby boomers are going to pass on. We have a much more diverse country. It's going to, there's going to be a lot of different things that'll, that'll play out over time that will probably create some, some sort of a new alignment, whatever that is. I, I can't necessarily predict what it'll look like, but I think it'll be out there. Yeah. There. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now do you, now do you feel like, you know, cause you know, looking at, you know, places that are like the major cities almost always go, you know, extreme progressive, extreme Democrat, that sort of thing. And then you get into like kind of like middle, middle America where they always say it's the fly, the flyover States. Cause all, the, all they really care about is the coast and that sort of thing. But do you feel like there's more like, open debate and discussion as opposed to a lot of the polariz like for example i'm out here in california out here in california you can't even like leave the house and say you're a conservative or for fear of right. somebody like trashing you or beating you up or you know whatever it is but then you get into like other places maybe it's still polarized but it's not like you're not fearful am, am i am i interpreting that right yeah i mean uh, de- definitely when you get to these big cities they're super progressive and it's like, so you always see, you know, you've long seen people in Silicon Valley do that. They'll say, I'm a, I'm a libertarian. You know, so it's like a lot of people who are kind of conservatives on the down low, and they, they say that they're a libertarian, or they, they talk about different issues. Um, I do think that when you get into, um, you know, you get out into other parts of the country, the politics are more moderate, and there's much more, particularly at the local level, much more um, 
construct, even when there's sort of like political rankering, people still like personally get along. They're still personally friends. You sort of see that in, in Indianapolis. It's more of a purple city. The city's kind of just now becoming really blue. It's a deep red state. There's some fighting, but you'll still see, you know, big time Democrats and big time Republicans hanging out at dinner. And not just the way that the billionaires hang out with each other on Martha's Vineyard, but I mean, there's still, there's still kind of like room to be, you know, multiple things here. But, you know, I think it's diminishing. I think the big cities are kind of on the, you know, kind of the leading edge of some of that. Yeah, no, that, that totally that totally makes sense. So, you know, one of the things that I did want to that I did want to kind of talk to you for a bit as well is, you know, you do have your newsletter that that goes out that you do you're writing consistently on, you know, masculinity and bi- and biblical masculinity and things like that. What is it specifically about that topic that you're like, okay, I need to do something on a consistent basis and really make that a focus? Yeah, really. There's a, there's a lot of things that, that come into it, but one of the things is just the juxtaposition of on the one hand, the well-known, long-standing fact that the church is mostly female, right? That the church is, you know, depends on the study, but it could be, it could be as much as 60-40 female, big female skew there. On the other hand, you see guys like Jordan Peterson selling two million books. And it's not just Jordan Peterson. I mean, there are a ton of these secular men's gurus um, Joe Rogan, you could think of him. You know, you could even think of like Ben Shapiro in the more political political mode as someone like that, or uh, a guy like Mike Cernovich, or um, you know, a lot of the red pill guys. There's just all these different. There's a million of them. So some of them are have millions of followers. Some of them have thousands of followers. And there's people, you know, that most of Americans have never heard of that you find out have like hundreds of thousands of subscribers to their podcast, you know, like this Sargon of a Cod guy and people like that. And one of the things that I started noticing about all these guys is that um, virtually none of them were Christian. Virtually none of them. All of the kind of kind of men's gurus or really popular sort of men's figures out there were, um, they're either atheists or they're, uh, they're new age. They tend to be new age. I, I categorize Jordan Peterson as sort of a new age. He's really a new age kind of figure. Yeah. Some of them are kind of neo-pagan uh, types. They, there's literally like a movement among some young men to be literally like worshiping Thor and stuff like that. I don't know if you saw, but like the U.S. military has now approved the hammer of Thor as an approved symbol on military tombstones that you could have to indicate your religion. I did not see that one, pagan. no. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, so on the one hand, I think that you have the church, which I think has the truth about the gospel, and yet doesn't appeal to men. And you had, um, you know, all these other guys over here, and I say, you know, we have to be in the game. And then part of that came out of my own experience uh, coming out of divorce and then being in the church and just really kind of taking it in and sort of like saying, hey, I need to learn and just behave the way and do the things that they've been telling me. And one of the things I started realizing very quickly was actually all the stuff they tell you about, about like women and relationships, it doesn't work. It's just, it's just not, it's just not accurate. So I did like years of research. I mean, I've read through tons of um, different uh, religious books. I've read through tons of, you know, kind of secular works, a lot of the history uh, on some of this I mean, I also read, gone, I studied all the internet personalities, all the red pill guys and the incels and, you know, all the, you know, the men's right episode, what are these guys all saying? And I decided I needed to start putting out a, um, you know, putting out a, a newsletter that's got like content that you're not going to get anywhere else. That's sort of designed to appeal to men, men and also to p- pastors and to educate them about the realities of the world that we're in that we're in and just how do how do we i don't pretend to even have all the answers how do we live as christian men in crazy town right that we live in right now it's not a very easy thing to do and the challenges are much deeper you'll get a lot of these especially the more famous um past a lot of them tend to be like baby boomer era and like the realities of trying to date when you're like late 20s or early 30s in today's world is totally different than when they met their wives and a lot of these that these pastors, they got married very young, often to like the first or second person they ever met. And even, and a lot of them are very frustrated now. Now they have a lot of, a lot of singles. 
they got a lot of, especially a lot of older singles in their pews. They don't know how to handle that pastorally. It's very difficult. And so they don't really, they're not really equipped by the nature of their life experience to understand what people are going through out there. So I'm trying to bring some of this together. I always say I'm a cultural critic. I'm not presenting myself as a theologian. I talk about different issues, but I'll talk about things that are going on in the culture. For example, I'll share all the research about how people behave on online dating sites, which gives you a – here's the reality of what – you know, the marriage market or the dating markets and like who messages whom and all these different things like that. There's a ton of like hardcore statistical data out there like that, much of which is very grim quite candidly, but people have to be educated in it and think about that. And then also just try to like, you know, question, you know, question some of the things I think that they've been teaching that are sort of like, you know, it, it's sort of like life coaching. It's not really theology. They're just giving advice, and it's advice that might have worked for somebody who's now seventy-five years old, but doesn't work for somebody who's twenty-five years old. Yeah. So, I, you know, I really wish, frankly, that I that I hadn't had to do this. I wish that some of these pastors and people would have taken on this information and then I would have probably just dropped it. Um, but I decided I had to. So I, I created this, it's just a once, once a month newsletter called the masculinist. So it's Aaron mask slash masculinist. You can sign up and it's, it's like deep stuff. I try to be unique, original, insightful, and just go through in detail. Like, Here's 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 what I, here's what I think, but also here's why I think it, and go through all the points and the evidence and things like that, and to just realize that like it's sort of like what do we do about this virus? There's a lot of things we just don't know. I mean, right now we're figuring out like what does it mean to live in this world. One of the the most popular thing I ever wrote really wasn't specifically about men, but it it was this framework I called the positive, the neutral, the negative world. The positive world was say, prior to 1994, I think is what I said. Prior to 1994, Christianity had positive social status in society. So if you said you were a good Christian church-going person, you might get extra bonus points and people thinking you're a really good person. But even an organization like Moral Majority speaks of a time when people at least plausibly argued that they were the moral majority. And you could see things like in 1987, when Gary Hart was running for president and got caught on his yacht with a mistress, he was forced to drop out. Then between, say, 1994 and 2014 was a period I called the neutral world. And this is really where Christianity no longer was like a positive. It was no longer normative. But it was sort of like we had this pluralistic public square. It's sort of like, yeah, you know, you're a Christian. You know, I'm this but we all kind of live here together. And um, it was sort of like, a, there was sort of this like pluralistic society. We were so, so sort of in there. So if you can think about like the positive world, a lot of the people we associated with that were sort of the, the old religious right people of the eighties, like Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson and Ralph Reed in this more neutral world. It tended to be people like Tim Keller or Andy Crouch, people who are much more metropolitan, much more at home in um, less UHF TV broadcasting, more New York Times op-eds. But it's like we're going to confidently engage. The people talk about cultural engagement. This is the era when people talked about cultural engagement. But after uh, 2014 is when I say we went into the negative world. And, we, and now we see that Christianity has negative status in society and that Christian, Christian morals are sort of seen as a threat to the social order and the public good. They're looked very down upon, and especially if you aspire to be in like a high status profession or a business world, to be a Christian actually can be a negative in a lot of places and a lot of cities. You're, you're going to look bad. People are going to think you're hateful. You're all these things, and so we really just now entered an era that is essentially unprecedented in the history of the United States, where Christianity always at a minimum like valued and like a, approved of in some way. And just recently we've gotten to a point where, you know, essentially Christians are now um, in this kind of minority status where the, the elite powers really do not like, um, do not like who they are. And so, I, and so I feel that puts us in a very, 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 challenging position and one that you know we, we haven't figured out how to engage with yet so it's it's 
kind of a quest, a little bit of a quest for how do we live now in this world. Yeah. Now, what, what do you feel like happened here? Like, because you were saying it's like 2014 to essentially like now we're kind of in that negative world. What do you think happened that really caused that shift in perspective uh, to happen at that point? Well, I just think, you know, it, it, it had been trending that way for a very, very, very long time. I mean, certainly since at least the 60s, but probably even before then, um, really going back, going back a long way, you know, even if you go back to say the late 1800s and the early 1900s, there are massive debates, you know, like the fundamentalist modernist controversy is frankly, many of the kind of, kind of elite Christians of their day kind of rejected the idea of the virgin birth and the bodily resurrection of Christ and the historicity of miracles and things like that. So when, when kind of Darwin came on um, you know, with, with what they called the higher criticism, these German scholars who started like criticizing the accuracies of the biblical text. It's been happening a long time. It's, it's very complex. Um, the, the best book I read on it, unfortunately, it'll take you a year to read it. It's Charles Taylor's A Secular Age. It's sort of like the, you know, it's, it, it's crazy. It's like a thousand pages long. Uh, it's super, super good, but super dense. Uh, it's sort of a how we got to now for secularization. But I think what happened in that era was essentially it finally just reached kind of the, the trend to a point where it, we, we hit the tipping point. Um, and, uh, it, you know, so, I mean, there's nothing magical about 2014. Was it 2015 when the Obergefell decision was on, on gay marriage? Right in there. It was right around that time, yeah. That, that's a pretty good example, I think, of how the kind of, you know, not even what I would call the, you know, the nine guys in the Supreme Court, that the average American felt very differently about kind of morality and the public good and the public order uh, than Christians had traditionally thought. And yeah. so it's, you know, when you sort of, you know, it's sort of like people always talk about them, um, and I don't know how accurate this is, that really the founders of America were not especially Christian. You know, they were deist and they were this and that. But they recognized that uh, the American Republic required essentially a religious people to function. So, so there's always kind of this respect for religion and value of Christianity that they had, and that's just not the case today. Now, the challenge is so. So I think part of the challenge is we have a we have a situation where people kind of reject Christianity, and, and especially the the moral the moral system of Christianity, which constrains what we're able to do. Uh, on the other hand, it, when they, their rejection is producing bad results, for example, you know, the fact that the out of wedlock birth rate is now 40 percent. I mean, that's like not good. And that has serious, I mean, serious, tangible, negative effects on the economic and, and social futures of those children. And you don't have to talk to a conservative to see that. Robert Putnam, the liberal sociologist from Harvard, wrote the book Bowling Alone. He wrote a book called Our Kids. where He talked about that. It's like, look. Yeah, the top 20% are doing great. The bottom 80% can't get married, can't stay married, huge problems, uh, you know, opioid crisis, all of these things. And it's become quite a, you know, quite a negative scenario. So in essence, our politics are, you know, in part a result in that we have essentially a libertinist uh, which is very popular. And that's what most people want is a very libertarian kind of view of how we get all of our lives. On the other hand, some decisions actually are better than others in terms of what they do for you in terms of the outcomes of your life. And we used to sort of constrain people's behaviors within certain guardrails, and now we no longer do. And for some people, that's very liberating, especially for the elite, right? Somebody who's really, really, really smart, talented, has a lot of family resources, um, you know, maybe this world actually for them, it's going to be a lot better for, for everybody else. It can end up, you know, especially for the kids who are like, if you've read J.D. Vance's book, Hillbilly Elegy, you know, he talks about growing up with like 10 different stepdads. People would ask him to, to describe his family and he would have to like write an essay of all the different half brothers and step brothers and people who are in the life and not out of the life. And he said that nothing really, um, you, you, you know, did, did he like less growing up than this kind of revolving door of men in his, in his mother's life? And he was able to overcome that 
but so many people today today don't do that. And so we see like Raj Chetty, the Harvard economist, who's done all the studies about like um, inter intergenerational uh, up social mobility, economic mobility. Basically, the the locations that have the worst upward mobility, the the top factor of that is percentage of single mothers. And so that's an unpopular topic for people. It's like they don't want to think about that. We can't square. We're trying to square the circle where we can have complete libertarianism for everyone, everybody wants while expecting it to produce the kind of results that we had in under a different kind of moral order. And as a society, we haven't quite gotten there, you know, yeah. And so that's, that's part of how it's, you know, how it's going to sort itself out in the coming years. Yeah. Well, you know, and I, and I find it interesting because, you know, we're, ha we're having a lot of this debate even within Christianity, I feel like, too, about, like, what, what is the role of a man and what is actual ma masculinity? And I feel like there's kind of, like, extremes on both sides. Like, there, there, there's, the, there's the feminist side, which is, you know, attacking any form of masculinity, it seems like. And then, there's, yeah. and then there's the response to feminism, which is anti-feminism, practically, where it's like, we're going to be as manly, manly, and butch, and hunter, and all that kind of stuff. So is, is the, the truth actually in the middle somewhere? Like, what's your take on the interpretation of actual proper masculinity? Yeah, well, yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, one of the things that we see, and you hit on it well, is when you define yourself in opposition to something, that's never a good place to be. You want to have your own agenda that you're for, not just someone else's agenda that you're against. And I think, candidly, this has been one of the things that's been a problem for conservatives since the beginning of essentially the modern political conservative movement and other things. They were against things. They were against communism. They were against these things the left was trying to do. But it was a very defensive posture, and they never really thought about the kind of society they wanted to live in. Now, early on, there was a lot of debate about that with guys like Whitaker Chamber and Russell Kirk, and you know. But ultimately, you know, that sort of stuff kind of like and not too many people read Russell Kirk today. Um, what, what I think is really interesting, though, think, thinking about thinking about kind of kind of manhood, um, I, I think there are a few things I would say on that. On that, one, there's a great book by a guy named uh, David Gilmore. Uh, I think he was a Yale professor, or maybe it was just that the book was on um, Yale University Press. It's called Manhood in the Making, and you can Google it. And also, the the, the website Art of Manliness. Um, if you know that site, actually did like a six-part summary of the book. So it's just, it's all actually out there. You don't actually need to buy the book. Uh, Art of Manly is a super popular site run by a Mormon, by the way, uh, another guy who's, uh, you know, so a lot of, uh, for some reason, just the, the traditional Orthodox Christians don't, don't have much presence in the space. But he basically surveyed all these different cultures, all these different, um, you know, around the world throughout time and said, what are the commonalities in like the roles of men? And there were a lot of them, but, but basically it came down to sort of call it protection or sort of the warrior, the warrior ethic, protecting the tribe, hunting for the tribe, you know, protecting the warrior being the archetype. Secondly, was sort of provision, you know, being able to, to collect the food, go out on the hunt. And then the third was essentially reproduction. So, you know, having a woman, sometimes having multiple women, fathering children, et cetera. And so here's, here's what's different about that in, in terms of what we have today. The modern church tends to um, talk about providing, for example, almost exclusively in terms of the home and the family. Tr traditionally, it was much more than that. You weren't just fighting to defend your personal home, but you were, you were with your tribe. You were fighting to defend your tribe, to build up your village, to build up your civilization. So in essence, men always... Um, we're producing more, producing a surplus of value for the community to essentially build up wealth of the whole, not just, just not just the private wealth. And the other thing, I think a lot of it was, um, you know, that uh, that, that unlike typically, typically you be, you became a, a woman from being a girl just by virtue of kind of maturing and going through time. Men certainly had to prove themselves. You have to prove yourself. You had to go into battle. You had to go through a rites of passage. You had to engage in competition. You had to be out in the public realm. Um, it was an ascribed status. You could fail at being a man. 
in a way that that women could not fail at being a woman by, by failing to, to 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 measure up. You had to essentially you know, be out there in public, be energetic, be energetic, be autonomous, be able to take your own independent actions and not be totally constrained by other people. Um, again, win competitions with other men to demonstrate kind of a place in the pecking order. And so where I think some of this comes down today that like the church gets very wrong. I mean, I, you, I don't know if you're familiar with this servant leader concept you hear a lot about. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the evangelical uh, men today will tell you that women are attracted to servant leaders. They want a man who's on fire for God, who's going to love his wife, serve his family, very conscientious, kind, all these things. Jordan, what would Jordan Peterson tell you? Jordan Peterson would tell you women are attracted to men who win status competitions with other men, <laughs> which in fact is what we see. And so it's a legacy of this kind of more primal, um, you know, masculinity. It's like, that's why you're attracted to, to like these gangster characters, the mob bosses, because even in the sense of they're immoral, we have this certain kind of primal respect for them. And so that's not to say that being godly and all of those things aren't important. Those are things that make you a good man, that make you someone that, you know, would be qualified to be married. Oh, this guy's marriage material. But they are what generate attraction, right? What generates attraction, I think it's pretty obvious. It's power and status, confidence and charisma, um, you know, it's looks and it's money. I mean, you look at those things, those things more than the servant leader are what generate attraction. So you have to have two things, right? One, you have to be attractive to the opposite sex. And the other thing is you have to be like a quality, you know, marriage prospect. Now, this is one of the challenges of our world. In our world, you don't have to be a quality marriage prospect in order to have lots of sex. If you have the attractiveness thing down, you can be out, you know, tearing it up with ladies, so to speak. Um, now, I would argue that ends, that, that sends you to a very bad place. Uh, it, it's amazing how many of the prominent pickup artists um, ultimately decide that lifestyle is terrible and they want to get out of it. So there's a guy by the name of Roosh Valizade, uh, who was a very, uh, very famous um, pickup artist. You know, he's now converted to Christianity. He's unpublished all of his, all of his books. And like a year in, he seems to be going because he realized you're doing all this stuff. And actually, it's not only bad for other people; it's bad for yourself ultimately. But, but you know, you can't conflate something that makes you a quality kind of marriage prospect versus something that generates attraction. There are lots of great people out there. Lots of great women we know, but we're not attracted to them. So we have to have both. We have to be interested in the person, and we also have to be a good marriage prospect. And the church fails by essentially focusing exclusively on the things that make you like a good marriage prospect. They'll say things like godliness is sexy. That's just simply not true. I mean, that's why you, if you, you know, and in fact, if you, if you, you, you read these guys' books, you'll often see the personal story shows that that's not true. Um, uh, Matt Chandler is one of the guys who likes to say that um, pastor of the village church, one of the biggest churches in the country in in, uh, Flower Mound, Texas, he likes to say godliness is sexy, but he tells the story of like when he was dating his wife, he didn't even tell his wife that he was running this gigantic thousand person Bible study in college because he knew that all the women were like throwing themselves at him because he was running this big Bible study. And he's like, I want to make sure she likes me for me, not just because I'm running this Bible study. So he understands that like being the top dog made him very, 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 very attractive. And so he, he kind of gets it. But then he tells people that it's the godliness that makes you sexy as opposed to being the guy running, running the Bible study. And so I think you need to have both. I certainly think you obviously have to be godly, but you don't want to be someone who just focuses exclusively on those things and nothing and not on um you know that there's this a John Cougar Mellencamp song. It's like, yeah, uh, you know, you better learn to play guitar, or something like that. You gotta have some things going on, yeah. right? You, you, you know, there's a reason women want to be with ballers, and you want to be, you, 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 you know, and being successful in your career, being charismatic, having like cool hobbies and great interests, and being like fun. Conference, those are not things that are, you know, negatives. You know, yeah. they're not ungodly. Right. Right. So. Uh, you know, I just I use the example of Donald Trump here. Do you think Melania Canals married him because he was a servant leader? 
right? Probably not, you know? And so there's like, you know, you, you see in the real world, right? The, the uh, you know, how this kind of works. Yeah. Now, you just have to look around. Yeah, exactly. And I, f- and I feel like to a certain degree, there, there has been this, and I know that there's there's been you know some pastors that really preach about how there's the the feminization of the church in general, and you know it it becomes this thing of the church is focused on felt needs, it's focused on you know the you know the more peaceful side of things, and there's a lot of feminization of of our pastors of of men within the church, and it's kind of like in in so there's been a like a lot of talk about that. But do you, do you feel like that is kind of stunting even Christianity from being leadership in the world by go, kind of going down that route a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I do feel like, um, yeah, it, it's it's a little challenging. I mean, I think we feminization or things are often kind of, I think you hit it on earlier. It's like people want to go be the macho man and, and go into the woods and like, you know, do whatever they do in these kind of like groups. But, but it's an affect. It's sort of a surface veneer as opposed to kind of an, an, an internal reality. I do think that the reality is our society today, we hear endless talk about the patriarchy, for example. And certainly there are things that you can argue um, are, are more skewed towards men. For example, the CEOs, the top politicians, etc., do tend – to, to be men. So at the top of organizations, definitely still the case, there's, there's men. You know, on the other hand, there are many things that are now, certainly in a way that was not true in our society until you know, relatively recently, now much more skewed in favor of women. For example, women, under the current divorce regime, women file 70% of all divorces. And I think women get custody of the kids in like 83% of the cases. And so if you're a fi- if you're like a man and a husband in a home, I my one friend says you're like an at-will employee. You, you know, could be fired at any time. You end up in a situation where you don't have a lot of leverage. Similarly, if I'm an unhappy man and I start complaining about my pastors mistreating me, nobody's going to care about that. But if an unhappy woman calls, you know, the religion reporter at one of these big, pay, you know, uh, papers and starts talking about how such and such person is a misogynist and treating bad, there's going to be like a big firestorm. A criticism. There was a, a pastor in Queens, just a regular guy, had like a small blog, probably not that many people read it. Uh, and uh, he he put up two blog posts. One of them was called 10 Men Christian Women Should Marry. It's like, here's 10 kinds of guys you shouldn't marry. Then he did another one called 10 Women Christian Men Shouldn't Marry. And that thing went nuclear viral and just generated massive amounts of hate and the idea that you could ever like criticize in any way or imply that any woman has ever done anything wrong you're just going to get like you're just going to get totally pillar so all of the societal kind of structures kind of the media structure the outrage structure the legal structure um really tends to, to weaken the position, I think, of a lot of these men. So you have, a, you have a situation where, as I said, the lead pastors of most of these churches are men. They may have a lot of best-selling books and all that. But ultimately, they're not in a position to be able to um, kind of make, make women unhappy. You know? yeah, and so a lot of us be honest. You know, and, and for many couples, the wife determines where they go to church. I mean, a lot of a lot of men just basically are like, oh, you know, the church is really more for the wife and the kids, and like I just go with what she wants, because there's that. I think, and that's at least the structures, and that's, but that's not how it has to be, you know. And I think one of the things that truly put Trump over the top in terms of the election is his just refusal to play that game. You know, the outrage. You get outraged about what I'm going to say. I don't care. And if you look at all of these men's gurus, uh, Jordan Peterson is one. I think, frankly, they manufacture these conflicts so that they can demonstrate themselves holding their ground. So the thing that really first made Peterson famous 
was his says, I, I refuse to use these pronouns you're telling me to use because that would be like expressing free speech. And then the other one that really got massive millions and millions of views was his appearance on Channel 4 in Britain, this interview with this woman where she's challenging him on these points and he just stands at his ground and he refuses to do it. Ben Shapiro does the same thing when he goes to college campuses and he gets in debates with these different different people. You create conflict and then demonstrate that you will hold your ground when the firestorm comes. And I think for a lot of people, that's a very powerful thing because many of them feel in their daily lives that they're, they're, they can't speak, you know, because they'll get in too much trouble and they're, they're, they're too much at risk. And I think it's especially, um, you know, it gets especially powerful when it happens in sort of venues where it's not. So, so there's, there's people who, for example, a lot of the old religious right guys, you know, they sort of built an audience off being hated. So they had an audience of like people, you know, like working class people and their whole shtick was being hated. You know, it's it's a lot different when, you know, someone who's like kind of on the inside, like or in one of these metropolitan areas, stands up and says whatever. Right. It's like a guy like Peter Thiel standing out and saying, I'm going to endorse Donald Trump, or Kanye. Think about Kanye is the best example. When Kanye comes up and says, I'm endorsing Trump. Like, that's like, that's taken a lot, putting himself in a lot, you know, a tough position, right? Because that's bold because he's sort of in the, he's in the club, you know, whereas if Alex Jones does what he does, you know, that's just been his shtick for a while. He had an audience of that. Right. So, I, so I do think that, and people are hungry, um, you know, for people who are going to speak truth or like stand up to some of this cultural pressure. But how, I mean, you know, I don't like the idea of creating conflict just to create conflict or, you know, some of that, some of that stuff I don't think very effective, but I do think there's been this element of, you know, there's people who don't want to, you know, who, who don't want to stand up and are very risky. It really counts. You know, being brave only counts when you're doing something that's really, really risky, when it puts you at risk. And that's one of the things that, that always comes about manhood. When you went to the battlefield and you could get killed, right? When the king was out there with his, you know, doesn't just sitting back on the front front, he was leading the army in battle, could be killed, could be captured, could be tortured to death. That's a very different thing than what you, what you see, you know, today. So you see, I see this all the time. If you go look at most of the Christian evangelical rags, you have a ton of people who will come out there and denounce Donald Trump. Oh, my gosh, they'll be so publicly aggressive about Donald Trump, or they'll be very aggressively denouncing, you know, racism or something like that, or white nationalism. Like, hey, I'll denounce it, too. I'll denounce it. I mean, it deserves to be denounced, but they only denounce things that they're going to get applauded for denouncing. You know, there's no courage in attacking Donald Trump, right? For one thing, he's, you know, I don't even know what, like he's manifestly does not live his life in accordance with Christian ethics. That much is clear, right? right? And so he's, a, it's a, you know, but it's popular. It's popular. You don't lose your status in the club. In fact, all of the never Trump Republicans all got great jobs, you know? You know, now they all work right for the Washington Post and the New York Times and places like that. Did, the people who are willing to, to say, I'm going to say something that might really cost me, put themselves at risk, those are the people that I think shows, generates that kind of respect in people. And that's kind of what's missing, I think, in the church. There, just, there aren't very many um, people showing that kind of courage today um, who, again, who aren't already sort of built on that old kind of you know, Pat Robertson model of, you know, I'm going to have this niche of, of my supporters who, who do that. You know, Peter Thiel, I think in his book, Zero to One, he says something like, I like to ask people a question, what very important fact or very important thing do very few people agree with you about? He said, that's a hard question to answer, right? Because if everybody already agrees to it, then by definition, it's not like a, an unknown fact. But if you go against the conventional wisdom, that's risky. 
and uh, he says something like, uh, courage is an even shorter supply than genius. And that's the promise. Like, it's courage in our society is in a lot less, um, a lot lower supply, I think, than genius. It's very hard to speak out when you're speaking out in a way that's going to make, you know, make your funders unhappy. If you're like in conservatism, or if you're one of these Christians, or if you aspire to be kind of in one of these, you know, you're working through the kind of the Christian career path and you're in a college ministry and you want to be a pastor someday, are you going to speak out and say something that goes against, goes against the club? You're probably not. And so um, I think that's where, that's where kind of masculinity comes into play more is to be willing to say risky things and, and to, and to pay the price. I mean, a lot of the, the people who signed the declaration, go back to the, to the American conservative movement right here. People who signed the Declaration of Independence knew that if the British caught them and won, they were all going to get killed. Yeah. <laughs> we're yeah. all going to be executed. And it's like, and if we are executed, we're, that's a price we're willing to pay because there's things that we care about more than our lives. There are things that are more important than our phony baloney businesses or phony baloney plantations you know, that the Virginia people owned or different things like that, that they were willing to suffer loss and that was sort of always the um, that was always the aristocratic kind of ethos in a, in, a, in a sense. And now we have a very bourgeois driven environment where sort of our creature comforts and our material comforts and our social status matter more to us than anything in the world. And I don't claim to be immune to that. Right. I feel the same pressures as other people. But it's uh, it's one that really uh, creates a big a big challenge in the Christian world because, you know, I think Christianity is sort of very, uh, you know, sort of very, again, it's kind of very consumeristic, you know, so kind of suburban consumeristic, just like everything else sort of like, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and we're, I, not different from the world. we're not different than the world at really the end of the day. Well, yeah. And, and, and I always say this too, is I feel like what happens within, within Christianity and what happens within politics oftentimes is going parallel. And, you know, society and Christianity is oftentimes going parallel where a lot of times we're going through the same things. It's just kind of Christianized a little bit, I think. Um, but I, but I think, I think one of those things that, that is really affecting society, politics and religion is this, is this idea of like groupthink. And it's like, you can't, you're not allowed to think outside of the box at all. You're not allowed to disagree with the consensus or else you're considered either a conspiracy theorist or you're a rebel or you're wrong, you know, whatever whatever that is. And I feel like to a certain degree that kind of goes along a little bit with what you're talking about in the sense of like, like you know, part, part of this is dealing with like courage to voice your opinions, voice your positions and that sort of thing. And then kind of let the chips fall where they may, I think, to a certain degree. And I feel like we kind of need more debate we need more uh discussion opposing views right now and i think that what what's happened is we've kind of had this cancel culture that basically silences any dissidents to a certain degree and i think right. that that's a really big problem in society right now yeah I, I, I it is i mean i i don't disagree and it's sort of like everybody's got like a program and it's like if you deviate from in any way it's not like um you know for example there are a lot of um not a lot, but some of these um, evangelical Democrats, like uh, Michael Ware, if you know who he is, he was yep. the, uh, one of the faith people under the Obama administration, and basically guys like him are essentially getting run out of kind of the Democratic Party because he's you know anybody who doesn't support abortion, it's like you got to get out of here. There's no place for for you. There used to be quite a few kind of rural pro-life Democrats. The, gov the governor of um, Louisiana is still one of them. But basically now it's like, you know, you can't, if you support anything, you know, less than, you know, aborting a child child while one small toe is still inside the womb, you know, after the child's been born, you know, you're, there's, you're, you're like, you know, worse than Hitler. And so I think there's like a lot of the, the space that used to be in these places, um, you know, the political parties used, used to essentially just be really very, very diverse coalitions of people who banded together to win office, right? So a lot of different kinds of regional factions and things didn't necessarily agree with each other on much, but they were sort of all in kind of this this mutual power. Well, now the, the parties have become much more defined by ideologies and many other things. 
And, uh, you know, there's been a lot written on that. Um, and so it's, it's not just the Democrats, it's just the Republicans, too. I and mean, it's like if you if you I guarantee you, um, having worked in that world, if you said something like maybe we shouldn't give favorable tax treatment to carried interest for hedge funds and venture capital firms, um, there will be if you work for a conservatism Inc. institution, there will be an organized attempt to get you fired. Yeah. You will at a minimum get a phone call and some very unpleasant conversations are going to happen because you simply cannot criticize the financial interests of the donor class um, without suffering and, you know, an immense blowback. And so it's, you know, it, 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 that's kind of the, the way it works. I think in too many things now. And part of it is just because we have a much more centralized country than we used to. We used to have all sorts of regional banks, regional department stores, you know, regional pharmacy chains, regional utility companies. Now everything's been consolidated into massive national institutions. Sometimes there's, you know, two or maybe it's a, with a couple other also rands. You can think about, for example, you know, AT&T and Verizon dominate the cell phone market. Home Depot and Lowe's dominate kind of the home improvement market. You know, CVS and Walgreens. There's a lot of two towers kind of competition out there. Well, it used to be like every in the 1980s, as recently as the 1980s, every community in America basically had a handful of locally controlled banks. The biggest banks in town were locally controlled. Now there's like four or five banks that totally dominate the U.S. And so when you have these very, very, very centralized power structures, centralized economic structures, it becomes very difficult. Everything tends to become monolithic, uh, kind of monolithic as, as well. And that probably started with mass media, probably started with like, you know, um, television, Hollywood and television started creating more of a national uh, things. But, but we see it all over. The local newspaper is going into decline. First off, the newspapers, local newspapers used to mostly be owned by local people and the new the person who owned the newspaper was a very very powerful player in town then they were all bought out by chains like gannett now they're all going out of business and we have a handful of national newspapers like the wall the wall street journal and the new york times and uh you know you go to you know a city like chicago let's say more professionals are reading the new york times than are reading the chicago tribune and it's been that way for a while so there's been a tremendous centralization of power, centralization of opinion, um, and, and kind of a handful of places, concentrated economic power, concentrated cultural power. And so there's less and less room for less and less room for dissent, I think, from from some of that, which is which is unfortunate because, you know, America has not been doing well since the year 2000. There have only been one year of GDP growth greater than 3%. I mean, you go back into the 80s and 90s, we're like averaging 3%. You know, yeah. we're like, it's like crazy. When you look at like income growth, job growth, GDP growth, we have not been doing well really since the dot-com recession that hit in around 2000. And so, plus all these issues around opioids, um, et cetera, so many towns that have just fallen into total decay. Our politics are kind of very, very dysfunctional. We can't repave our roads. Um, so many things that are wrong. Uh, you, you know, so I think that this system that we have is just objectively not producing great results. Not to say that everything's bad. You know, I mean, we do have, you know, we do have Skype, which we're able to talk to each other on. So there has been some technological improvements, you know, but it's been pretty well documented that this has not created some productivity boom or some growth boom. Right. The gains accrued to a very small number of people who managed to establish monopolies. I mean, that's one of the things Peter Thiel says. It's like monopoly is how you make money. <laughs> and so all Silicon Valley you know, firms are sort of predicated on, on becoming a monopoly or selling out to a monopoly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, you know, yeah. And, and, and that's one of those things, too, that I've, I've, I've had a lot of conversations with people about is – you know, I feel like as conservatives, a lot of times, you know, we're, we're very critical of big centralized government. But then I think that growing parallel with that is big centralized corporations and businesses and what that actually does to the everyday American. You know, back in the day, you know, with with America, our, you know, our founding all the way up until you know, more modern recent history, 
most or not most, but a lot of business was small mom and pop shops that were like locally owned in places. And I think that 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 instilled a lot of um, self worth. It instilled personal responsibility because everybody was responsible for their own little business that they own. Maybe they hired two or three, four or five people that were working there, things like that. But then now we've kind of offset that, you know, in the same way that we offset responsibility to the government, we're kind of offsetting to the big corporations, like, you know, they're gonna give me my, my salary, I just show up, put my eight hours in, go home. There's no level mm-hmm. of responsibility or self-worth from that sense. And I wonder how much that's actually contributing to a lot of the downfalls we're seeing uh, today in, you know, you know, how we view ourselves, how we view our neighbors, how we how we view the world. Yeah, what, we, what you this has been the case in other countries as well, you know, is that the big corporations work hand in hand with big government. That's one of the ways that they actually become very centralized, dominant corporations is because of regulatory capture and and, and lobbying and special carve outs. And so um, we, we'll often see that the government essentially will outsource things that the government can't do to these big companies. So YouTube and these guys will say, you cannot post anything that contradicts the World Health Organization, or we will delete it. So the U.S. government couldn't tell you to do that, but they can partner with these governmental-type organizations and let the private company do the censorship. And, and so it's, um, you, you know, I think a lot of times these companies couldn't couldn't get get big if they hadn't essentially got had the government behind them, um, allowing them to do it behind all of these monopolies is some sort of special governmental favor that is protecting them. Um, you know, one of them is the, you know, with, with, with say the, the social media companies, the federal government passed the telecom act of 1996. that says you have no liability for anything that you publish on your platforms because we we're treating you as essentially liability. It's the section 302 of the Communication Decency Act, you're immune. So you basically can never sue Facebook or YouTube or any of these companies for anything that anyone posts on the platform. Now you and I put up a blog post, we can be sued over our blog post, right? But but these other guys are totally immune. So they've got special protections that no other industries have. You know, Silicon Valley was given special exemptions from taxation, for example, for a very long time. Internet transactions, the federal government said they can't be taxed. So there was a lot of things that were given to them to build these monopolies and sustain them in their monopolies uh, today. So I mean, I think a lot of times um, big government is manifesting itself through big corporations. You see this a lot with all these nonprofits. And uh, things like you probably remember Acorn and many of these mm-hmm. community organizing groups that they are government funded. They're either funded directly by the government, or the government would mandate that, for example, a bank that they were, you know, oh, it's like we caught you in some some dodgy banking. We'll give you a deferred non prosecution agreement and all this stuff. But oh, by the way, we need to create a slush fund for our buddies and a lot of these activist organizations and fund them all. So. Almost all of these nonprofits that you always hear about, like, oh, this this nonprofit, they're stuffed full of government money, essentially. And so, you know, the government is really, you know, I think big government often manifests itself through tentacles and sort of private entities, so nominally private entities. That's like maybe a topic for another conversation there, but it's one, yeah. one of the ones we, we shouldn't lose sight of. The people that conservatives are so used to thinking about just the government. Mm-hmm. Um, and losing losing fact, uh, losing um, you know sight of the fact that these other entities, which are often very very government sponsored, are in effect some of them are private governments, right? Facebook is the government of Facebook. If you think about, for example, in New York, you try to get a yellow cab. There's something called the Taxi and Limousine Commission that regulates taxi cabs and makes them follow the rules. Uber, you say Uber is a private company. But Uber is also a private taxi and limousine commission. It sets all the rules and regulations on which anyone can use their platform. They can kick you off. You have no good to, to due process. So I think we ought to look at some of these organizations as private governments. And if we thought of them as a, a privately owned government, we might take a little bit of a different um, thing. And, and the privately owned government is usually backed up by the actual government. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and that, that's an interesting kind of concept too, especially when we're dealing with like a lot of, uh, you know, that's kind of the excuse that a lot of people give to basically allowing Facebook or Twitter or YouTube to censor people is, well, they're a private company. So there is no constitutional rights within there. Um, but then there's this kind of conversation of they're so big and they've got the monopolies and their platforms are huge. That's how people communicate. So if they're taking away people's freedom of speech, while it's not the government, I mean, right. it, it, it kind but of nobody is. Says, right? Nobody says that the electric company is a private company and should be able to turn your electricity off if they don't like your politics. Right. Right. So that's number one. Secondly, uh, nobody, there's not one person that believes that you can't regulate what a private company can do or say. Right. I guarantee you every single one of those people saying it's a private company, they can do whatever they want, would never in a million years say, oh, they would be right to kick black people off their platform because it's a private company. Right. No, we've already decided there's some things that are just wrong. And I don't care if you're a private company. You can't do them. Yeah. And we are, we, you know, and so the question is not whether there are restrictions on what private companies can do. The, the restrictions are what are we as a society willing to allow those companies to do? We don't let the water company or the gas company or the electric company decide who they do and don't want to do business with. Right. That's, a very, you know, and so I think when you start looking at um, many of these things, when they get collapsed down to essentially utility, infrastructure, critical, you, you can't even like without using, um, you know, maybe we ought to be thinking about the kinds of common carrier restrictions that are on other people. I'm not saying I endorse that. I'm just in these very simplistic arguments about it's a private company. Uh, no, nobody ever really believes that. Nobody believes that. Yeah, and that, and that's some of those kind of conversations that I think that need to be had with, within America, within society, of figuring out again, kind of figuring out who we want to be as America. You know, what what do we want for you know the the companies that are around us that have all the big power and things like that. And so you know, I think it's important that you know that we continue to kind of have those have those discussions overall. Um, and I know some people are having them, but it's not it's not happening enough. I think um, today. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I think the real question we should just say is it's a private company. They sh they can do what we want. Isn't, isn't that the, the real question should be what kind of society do we want to have? And then think about the best way to accomplish that. And there's a lot of ways that we might say, oh, great. Socialism is going to be the right answer. You know, a lot of regulation may not be the right answer, but you know, this idea that like private companies can do whatever they want I don't understand why that's the end. That's the means. The free market is a means to an end. It's not the end in and of itself. And I think that people have confused kind of the the means with the ends that we want in some of these cases. And, uh, you know, so I think we ought to think a little bit more deeply. And in fact, if you go into conservative history, the history of the political conservative movement, there were a tremendous amount of debate over that very topic that ultimately – um, kind of get it ended up getting resolved over time in uh, you, you know this kind of very libertarianish view view of the world, which um, in fact is very much because what a lot of people who make their money through a lot of those things, um, you know that they're the ones that that fund everything. Right. So I'm you know I'm pro I'm, I always like to say I'm pro market. I want us to have functioning markets and the the uh, you know a government the one of the main reasons governments don't work. Well, it's because their monopolies, and monopolies don't function well. They don't serve the public interest. You need competition, and if we don't have don't have competition, just the fact that there's a private monopoly running something doesn't make it any better. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that um, I think that's the case. I, I think I think we need to be looking at that again, and and rethinking you know again rethinking some of the rethinking some of the old things. We shouldn't uh, you know go off the deep end for socialism by any means. But we ought to we ought to be thinking about you know what's and also what's different today versus what was different in 1980 when Reagan was elected, and America had very different problems than America has today. Yeah, right. yeah, and, and again, it, it, know, it's America a had very had, had had very high taxes. It had inflation. It had tremendous overregulation to the economy, and deregulation, and tax reform, and you know, what the Fed did around, you know, killing inflation, those were things we didn't have. Now we live in a completely, totally different environment where our, our problems are much, much, much more, more different. 
Yeah, and, and, and I think that that's one of those things where, you know, especially with how everything has changed over the last 10, 20, 30, 50 years, it's vitally important, I think, that we have the conversations that we don't, not that we don't take anything off the table, but but to a certain degree, we have to allow different ideas to, you know, enter into the debate, we discuss, we debate, we figure out what works, what doesn't work, and let the arguments, let the people actually make arguments and follow through and not just say, well, that person disagrees with me, so they should be canceled. And I think that right. if we have more of these kinds of debates, maybe we could get into somewhere here in the country where it's like, okay, maybe we can move forward instead of just kind of standstill of polarization. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and you know, a lot of it's gonna, you know, you know, I think a lot of it's generational. You know, the baby boomers have really run America for a very long time. You know, Bill Clinton was the first baby boomer president. The you know the baby boomers really sort of took over in the late eighties, early nineties, and they've been everything since. Clinton, Bush, and Trump were all born the same year, nineteen forty six. Hillary Clinton was born in 1947. Joe may even be silent generated. I don't know how he's old. He's been older than them. But I think the point is not so much that I don't think they're that's a, that, that they're bad, but like when you have sort of a generation. Your, your generational experiences shape up how you think the world. So sort of like that generation that lived through the Depression, you know, people like my grandparents, they would like save Christmas wrapping paper and reuse it the next year because – you know, it was really important to, to be frugal. They never, ever got over like that. Right. And, you know, the baby boomers had their experiences. And in, in essence, politically, for a lot of them, their glory days were the Reagan era. And they cannot relate to the fact that it's like a lot of these pastors. That, you know, as I tell you about these, especially these older ones, they can't relate to what it's like being a young person trying to, to date and get married today. It's just a totally foreign concept. The politics and the problems of America are totally foreign to the life-shaping experiences of the baby boom generation. And so I think it's going to be younger generations who are going to have to rethink some of these things because it's the millennials and Gen Z who are experiencing the reality of downward social mobility, which is the opposite of what the boomers, you know, basically spent their lives in a rising, you know, environment of upward social mobility, they did far, far, far better than their parents did. Now we have downward social mobility. We have massive student loan debt issues. We have, you know, 40% out of wedlock birth rates. How many baby boomers grew up with divorced parents? Not very many, right? So the social realities and the various realities of the today are very different for other people. As I said, I'm the child first generation of no-fault divorce. Generation X were like the latchkey kids and uh, was sort of this, you know, it was the old Kramer versus Kramer movie and, you know, Rosemary's Baby, kind of these, all these negative, kind of negative kind of views of children and divorce and all that. And, you know, so we are, you know, only now are we experiencing the reality of like having life grown up, people who've experienced much of their adult life growing up in divorced homes, something the baby boomers never experienced. And so I think... It's, we think very differently about things like divorce because we experienced it in a way they didn't experience it, right? Yeah. They never experienced what it's like to grow up as a child in a divorced home. And so I, I, I think that it's going to take generational turnover in some extent to make some of this thing happen. I always The, the illustration I always like to use is, you know, the generation that leaves Egypt seldom gets to enter the promised land, <laughs> you know? And it's like... When you have some kind of a shock to your system, you experience some sort of a trauma. And even for the for the for the Hebrews, leaving Egypt, even though it was a grand liberation, was also a trauma. It destroyed the only world they ever knew. They could never in, enter into a new reality. They were still psychologically living in Egypt, even when they were on their way to, to the promised land. And so it takes oftentimes another generation to really navigate over the disruption. And, um, you know, so I, I think that's what's going to have to happen here. So long as we have a totally baby boomer dominated politics, it's going to be uh, challenging to move forward. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that, that definitely makes sense. Um, so if people want to, you know, keep up on like your writings and, and you know, sign up for your newsletter and things like that, what, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, yeah. So 
the, again, the best way to get the newsletter, the masculinist is Aaron Wren, A-A-R-O-N-R-E-N-N.com slash masculinist. And Aaron Wren.com is my main website. My main website just has mostly my writing on cities and urban policy. I still do a lot of that work. The masculinist is kind of on the side. So you might want to follow both. Yeah, definitely. I, I highly recommend doing that. You know, check that out. Um, but yeah, I, I really appreciate you coming on and, and having, having this conversation. Me. I really, I really enjoyed it. Love to have you back on sometime. Thank you. Thanks. Love to. Yeah, definitely. And then, and then for everybody else out there as well, um, uh, the, the next episode of Conversations with Jeff will be uh, next week. We've got Tuesday the 28th. We've got uh, Michael Schuer will be back on for a fascinating conversation as well as Colonel Mike. So that will be a lot of fun, um, another fun conversation. Then the next day, the 29th, we've got another Conversations with Jeff with uh, Bishop Larry Gators and uh, and Carl Crew are both going to be on. And we're going to actually get into some conspiracy theories and how that plays into Christianity and just kind of have fun with that. We never really get into that kind of a thing. So I just want to have a little fun intellectual exercise there. So that'll be a fun thing on the 29th. So check those out. Stay tuned, like, subscribe, all the good stuff. And then uh, we'll see you guys next time.